Hello everyone um, and welcome to tonight's webinar where we'll be discussing insights and tips for a career in endocrinology which is the specialty that we all love. Uh, my name is Kerry Devine, I'm a registrar in diabetes and endocrinology based in the northeast um, and I'm really pleased to be hosting tonight's session where we have a panel of experts um, from around the country. Um, kicking off tonight will be Professor Stephanie Baldewig. Um, she's a consultant endocrinologist and clinical lead for diabetes and endocrinology in UCL, London. Uh, she's an expert in pituitary disease in particular um, and trustee for the Pituitary Foundation. Um, but I also know that she's got a passion for teaching and training and, and we'll be hearing about that from her uh, this evening. And we also know her well as the head of our Society for Endocrinology Clinical Committee. Um, I'll just ask our other speakers to keep the microphones off during uh, the presentations um, and I'll encourage you all to please uh, share any questions that you might have uh, through the chat box um, and we'll be trying to come to all of those at the end if we can during the Q&A. Um, so over to you, Professor Baldwin. Thank you very much, Kerry. Good evening, everyone. I think we have a great attendance, so thank you all for making time. I am dialing in from London. I think it's uh, people from all over the country, so welcome. I am going to share my screen and then we are ready to go, I think. Let's see. There we are. There we are. Lovely. Right, and so if you have any questions as you go along, just uh, write them down in the chat box and we'll come to them at the end of the evening. So anything goes. So my task was to talk to you about why endocrinology. And I am going to start to just tell you a little bit about my journey and how I got here. Uh, I was born and brought up near Potsdam in, in Germany and then moved to, to Berlin to study at the Humboldt University. So I did my medical degree in Berlin and I left with more than a medical degree from that university. I had two children as a medical student, so there you are. Uh, and I then moved with my family to London to just see what else there was in the world. And I was lucky enough to get funding for an MD at UCL. Uh, I then joined the uh, a training rotation in London, did my specialist training across the North Central London rotation, uh, mainly part-time, in fact, before I did uh, everything full-time, but then I mainly worked part-time and then got a consultant job at University College London. So I was very lucky. That was my dream job. And uh, I got there. I, so you may wonder what my life is like, and you. this is my week. Uh, and the others will probably laugh to themselves because of course they know that the week, there's much more being squeezed into this week. But the official weeks uh, includes a clinic on a Monday, uh, a joint pituitary clinic with, a, with the surgeons on a Tuesday after a pituitary meeting where we discuss all the cases. Uh, another clinic in the afternoon followed by discussion of cases with my team, uh, a traumatic brain injury clinic on a Thursday with psychologists, neurologists, uh, and others, research meetings usually on a Thursday afternoon, and then teaching on a Friday morning, as well as supervising uh, service development and a discussion with, the, uh, with my colleagues. Those of you who are still with me will say, actually, there are seven days in a week, so where is your Wednesday? And I have uh, worked most of my life, most of my sort of later life part time uh, to spend time with my family. I've got two grandchildren. So this picture on the left shows you that I love baking and we spend a lot of time in the forest making dens. So I don't work on a Wednesday. That's literally my completely off devices, off everything day when I just relax. Uh, the weekend is more busy. You can see there's a lot of there's Pilates, tennis, nature, friends, and music. There's also a lot of work. Um, unfortunately, it does spill over, but generally I enjoy it, so I don't uh, mind. So what do I do uh, and what do I do and enjoy? So there's clinical work in my day. So there's in-out patients, uh, diagnosing, treating patients, a lot of discussion about self-care, 
Uh, I refer to colleagues if necessary. I supervise trainees and teach students in clinic and I talk with GPs and referrers. We do ward consults. Uh, I'm in several MDTs, so team meetings where we discuss cases in a multidisciplinary way. And I spend quite a lot of time discussing complex patients with my colleagues. What else do I enjoy? I love education, as Carrie said. I teach, uh, I lecture, I have, I am educational supervisor for my registrars. I am examiner at UCL. I have, a, uh, I have MD students. I'm personal tutor, tutor for some MSc students. Uh, I provide a lot of feedback and assessments. I'm on the assessment panel for the registrars annually, and I'm involved in recruitment of new registrars. I, in the past, also had formal roles, and this is really just to show you that things change in your career. So you do something for a few years, you like it, that leads to something else, you and you you you, you change. So I, I was training program director, and then I was associate dean for the academic trainees uh, in London and the Southeast for a while. What else do I enjoy? I am involved in quite a lot of research. Uh, I mainly do outcome studies, so I don't do bench work. I uh, look after patients with pituitary disease. We look at their outcome at things to influence how to influence their outcome. We have studied the effect of COVID quite a lot. Uh, we've looked at patient satisfactions. So I'm very keen on involving patients in our research and understanding how the medical experience actually is for them. Uh, and more recently, in the last year, we've started doing uh, quite a lot of AI in pituitary disease uh, work. What else do I enjoy? I'm I'm on the uh, I I work for the Royal College. Uh, I'm on the Society of Endocrinology Clinic Committee, so I chair that committee. I'm member of the Corporate Liaison Committee, which is very in interesting, working with industry, on the Public Engagement Committee, which is what it says, trying to engage the public and help to understand raise awareness of endocrinology. Uh, and I'm also have been for the last probably almost twenty years. Uh, being a trustee and vice chair uh, of the medical committee of the Pituitary Foundations at the patient support group. I'm also doing some management. So again, that goes into my job plan. I'm the lead for the diabetes and endocrinology at UCLH for the last six years. I lead the team. I give day-to-day -day clinical oversight. I do a lot of communication with the trust managers and backwards and forwards. I'm, I've been building the team, so I've been creating business cases to find money for new vacancies. Uh, I'm liaising across the hospital and I always troubleshoot, which I quite enjoy. I do other things and uh, again, Christine and Jonathan may have other things they don't enjoy. So I have to deal with complaints. Uh, I have to deal with staff gaps. So suddenly we have, especially with COVID, we have met people missing. I have to endure very slow NHS IT and a lot of bureaucracy and forms. And for the last year, we had a lot of demands uh, because obviously we needed to look after the acute patients with COVID and try to keep our own patients safe at the same time. So in preparation for tonight, I just thought I asked my friends, and that really what happens in endocrinology. If you are stuck, you can ask for help. So I tweeted this a couple of days ago saying, I'm speaking tonight. Why did you people choose endocrinology and what's your top tip for budding endocrinologists? And I've sent this tweet to about sort of 10 groups of people I thought might engage with me. And my top reply, there were many excellent ones. Everyone was very thoughtful, but the top re uh, reply was from Dr. Punis who said, I chose endocrinology because it's the closest to magic and wizardry. A sprinkle of hormones controls how the whole body functions. So, I liked that because I think there is a sort of mystery about things and a bit of detect detective work. Uh, and when it works, it's great. And when it doesn't work, it's frustrating, but you keep going. I didn't want to show you all the tweets of everybody. So I've put this into a work cloud to see. So why are you, why did you choose endocrinology? What is your career like for you? And you can see this is as, as everyone who responded. The patients are really central to the to to everyone's feeling about endocrinology and their thinking. Research comes up very high. Uh, opportunities uh, to do things is very varied. So varied nature comes. Uh, clinician satisfaction, 
a good patient engagement uh, and cross-disciplinary and so on. But it's, it's, it's a patient in a center, I think, which is for me also uh, really essential. And I've put my own thoughts at the bottom. So I think endocrinology is fascinating. It's fun. It's very holistic. It's a great team effort. Uh, you have to have logical sort of th thinking. Uh, it's very multidisciplinary. So you work with the obstetricians, the surgeons, the uh, ophthalmologist, biochemist, and so on. So you learn always more things. Uh, there's a great lab and physiology interface. You need to have a long-term view. Uh, it's very patient-centered and there's quite a lot of uncertainty which you need to sort of sit, uh, needs to sit comfortably with you and the patient. So you need to make that acceptable for everyone. These are people's top tips. Uh, so people said you should develop a passion so work becomes fun. You should enjoy the training and the best skill to develop, listen with empathy for people with chronic disease. You should sort of carefully choose and maybe look at work-life balance. You could see from my weekend slides that I haven't really mastered that, but then in the week I have a day where I feel I do. So I think you just have to do what works for you. You should find an endocrinologist who inspires you to talk to them and ask them to help you in getting involved in endocrine projects. And you should try to get to some endocrine clinics. So these are my Twitter colleagues. I just want to thank them because they put a lot of thought into their replies. And you can see Jonathan is on there as well. Uh, and if Christine replied and I didn't pick it up, I apologize. Uh, but I wanted to just bring you to uh, bring your attention to three more quick things. Uh, this is a response from Vic Smith, who is uh, very active and leading the Addison support group. And so this is a patient saying, I'm teaching uh, junior doctors and students and I love the comment about wizardry and I might use it because managing endocrine conditions feels like a mystical, magical art. And this is a colleague of mine is an oncologist. So this is really to demonstrate the multidisciplinary working. So he's saying from a perspective of an oncologist, this is incredibly important from at least two angles. Our treatments can cause a wide range of endocrine dysfunction. And in fact, we do see a lot of this and long-term endocrinology input is needed. Secondly, endocrine cancers are fascinating. And then uh, this is really to help me to uh, lead to the next talk. So this is Dr. Hazelhurst, Jonathan who is on this talk, who's saying, it looks like I might be a tough act to follow, uh, lots of great points in the thread. And in fact, what really he's demonstrating is excellent bedside manner. Again, he's collaborative, he's including me, he's saying, I will do even better than you for the greater good of everyone who's listening. Uh, and then this came up in the Twitter chat and I think it's a great cup. The whole uh, endocrine Twitter world is trying to find where to buy this now. And really this is saying the second line, an endocrinologist, a person who's always right. So if that sits with you uh, with a bit of tongue in cheek, then maybe we are the right specialty for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Baldwin. That's brilliant. I want one of those mugs. <laughs> um, I think we, we won't ask you any questions just now. We'll keep that to the end. But I mean, what more can we say? I think you've said it all, really. Uh, that, was a, that was a brilliant introduction for us tonight. Thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, for now, we'll just move on to our next speaker, um, who is Professor Christine Bollart. Um, she's a professor of endocrinology at the University of Birmingham, um, and uh, she's also a consultant endocrinologist there as well. Um, she's got particular uh, interest and expertise in the thyroid, particularly thyroid cancer. And, and excuse me, she's very research active, um, both in the lab and through clinical trials. Um, and you'll see her involved in lots of guidelines about thyroid, um, publishing and speaking internationally on thyroid uh, disease. So we're really pleased to have her uh, with us tonight and I think uh, talking some more about her research experience as an endocrinologist. Uh, so over to you, thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you for um, asking me to speak tonight. Um, as Jonathan quite aptly said, uh, Stephanie is always a hard act to follow. So my talk is more about a career in academic endocrinology. Um, so I will talk to you, uh, you know, why I started off in endocrinology, uh, tell you a little bit of the various 
parts of research I've been involved in. Um, throughout the talk, uh, I will you know, try to uh, demonstrate that it is possible to balance academia and clinical work, which I think is one of the major draws for me to uh, academic and chronology. Um, talk to you a little bit about clinical guidelines setting, how important it is that we keep the patient at the center of everything we do. And then I'll end with some top tips. So why did I choose endocrinology? Well, my children would say because I'm a nerd uh, and because I like rules and pathways um, and uh, you can call it wizardry. Um, I like the uh, fact that uh, there is this, there are these nice homeostasis mechanisms that in many cases help us understand uh, you know, how a patient's endocrine uh, system is functioning. But I think a further reason why I think I was drawn to endocrinology is because it tends to be uh, quite an academic specialty. Um, and, you know, I will hopefully demonstrate to you that uh, I've been involved in all these various parts uh, of research, but how they very nicely can interact from basic science to translational and clinical science, and then how that translates into clinical practice and uh, into clinical guidance. Um, just very briefly, I uh, qualified um, a long time ago um, in Belgium, um, then came to the UK, went into the UK system. And in 2000, uh, I became a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow uh, working uh, in the endocrinology department with Jane Franklin uh, in Birmingham. Uh, and that's when I started doing mainly laboratory research uh, and to a lesser extent, sort of clinical and database research. I then became a clinical lecturer where most of my research was clinical. Uh, and then went on to have an MRC Clinician Scientist Fellowship, where again, a lot of my work was laboratory based, but where I also continued clinical research and started dipping my toes in clinical trial research. I then became a senior lecturer, um, where most of my research was clinical, uh, and I kept involved uh, in with clinical trials. And then as my career progressed, um, it's been mainly clinical trial research, but also I started uh, being on some guideline uh, committees. And uh, at the moment, uh, what I do is set a lot of guidelines on how to manage patients with thyroid diseases. And I'm not gonna dwell too much on uh, my research findings, but just to show, give you a flavor of, of uh, what I've done. Uh, so this is one of my first papers. So when I started, what we looked at was an oncogene. Um, you don't need to know the details, but a pituitary tumor transforming gene. And what we looked at was uh, expression of this gene in thyroid cancer. And uh, this graph here illustrates that this was overexpressed in thyroid cancers when you compared that with normal thyroid tissue at an mRNA and at a protein level. But importantly, clinically, what uh, we found was that this was overexpressed in the current thyroid cancers, indicating that this molecular finding may well have a prognostic uh, implication. Uh, during my clinician scientist fellowship, then, uh, what we found importantly, and again, this is therapeutically important, is that this gene actually interferes with uh, uptake of uh, iodine. And of course, iodine is one of the treatments we give to patients with thyroid cancer. And if a tumor doesn't take up iodine, then treatment can become difficult. And what we found was that uh, if we had thyroid cells and we uh, put this uh, oncogene or its binding factor in it, that the iodine uptake went down. Um, in my clinician scientist fellowship, then we translated that into mouse models, and we found that uh, when these oncogenes were overexpressed, as you can see here, compared with a wild type mouse, there was a significantly increased uh, size of the thyroid gland. Um, and importantly, again, we confirmed uh, when we cultured cells uh, from these mouse uh, thyroid glands that the iodine uptake was reduced. And actually, when we specifically targeted this uh, oncogene, that we could increase the iodine uptake again. So this indicated that potentially this can be a translational uh, tool that we can use uh, by uh, stopping this inhibition on iodine uptake by interfering with this particular oncogene, we may actually improve treatment for patients. Um, and so my findings uh, started off a whole group who is now working and you know, I'm still involved from the fringes uh, with this group that have really unraveled uh, how these oncogenes interfere with uh, iodine uptake. Um, this complicated slide here illustrates this. I don't have time to go into too much detail, but essentially uh, what our group are now trying to do is to um, find novel ways of treating resistant thyroid cancer. So those cancers that cannot take up iodine. Um, 
And so my basic findings uh, that started uh, when I was a research fellow in 2000 may well in the future translate to novel therapies and future guidelines. Like I said, I also did a little bit of clinical research during my um, uh, research time as a, as a research fellow in this clinician scientist fellowship. And this is actually my most quoted paper, which has got about 750 uh, quotations. And essentially, this was a very simple database study where we looked at patients who presented with an enlarged thyroid gland, and we tried to see whether they're presenting serum TSH concentration, so thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a, a standard test you do in anyone who presents with uh, thyroid enlargement. We wanted to see whether the TSH concentration actually predicts whether a tumor is going to be cancerous or not. And lo and behold, we found that if TSH was higher, this was more likely to be a malignant tumor. And even when TSH was in the normal range, you can see this sort of dose response curve here, indicating that a simple clinical finding actually may be translationally relevant. And therefore, measuring a serum TSH at baseline may actually be a predictive tool. I've also had a large interest in managing hyperthyroidism. Um, and um, as you know, uh, one of the treatments for this is giving radioactive iodine. I'm a big fan of giving radioactive iodine. Uh, and what this graph here illustrates, again, from our database study, is that giving a single dose of radioactive iodine is actually a very effective treatment, resulting in a cure of nearly 90% of patients, um, is certainly with a dose of 600 megabecquerels, and that the higher the dose you give, the more likely it is that the patient subsequently becomes hypothyroid. Now, the management of hyperthyroidism is important because uh, this is a condition which obviously results in significant symptoms, but also results in long-term cardiovascular mortality for patients. And uh, in Birmingham, we've had a long tradition of confirming that indeed this is a disease that results in long-term mortality. Um, but most of the studies that have been done had only looked at patients who'd had radioactive iodine. So this was the first study where we looked at patients who either had medication or radioactive iodine and looked at their mortality. We confirmed that there was increased all-cause mortality, that this was mainly due to circulatory deaths, but we found that if you give patients radioactive iodine and make them hypothyroid, that actually you overcome the increased mortality risk. You can see here that the standardized mortality ratio is actually not increased uh, in this group. And this is something that has certainly been incorporated in the NICE 2019 guidelines for which I was the clinical lead. I've also had an interest in uh, iodine status. And of course, as you know, iodine is really important for the synthesis of thyroid hormones. And until um, the uh, 2010, we didn't really know what the UK iodine status was, the previous uh, assessments having been uh, multiple, multiple years ago. So when uh, this was assessed in 750 school, year, sc school girls um, in 2010, you can see uh, that actually a significant proportion of these girls were iodine deficient. So this would be the cutoff for an iodine status uh, in iodine urinary excretion. And you can see that uh, at least 80% uh, of girls were actually mildly or moderately iodine deficient, indicating that we are an iodine deficient region. This, of course, is particularly important during pregnancy. And these findings have been inco incorporated in the RCOG uh, green top guidelines for management of thyroid and iodine status in pregnancy, which are due to be published later this year. I've also had an interest in what thyroid antibodies, because as you know, uh, most thyroid disease is caused by antibodies, autoimmune disease, what, what these antibodies do to pregnancy outcomes. And so uh, this is the result of uh, a meta-analysis that resulted in a trial that I've been heavily involved in looking at what anti-thyroid antibodies do uh, to pregnancy loss, indicating that if uh, women have these uh, TPO antibodies, they are much more likely to lose the pregnancy. And there's a similar slide that I could show showing that they're more likely to have preterm birth. Uh, so this was uh, true both in cohort and case control studies. And in order to investigate this further, we then conducted a large uh, clinical trial. So this was published in the New England Journal in 2019. Uh, it's called the tablet trial. And essentially what we did, we gave to women who had a history of miscarriage um, or infertility. We randomized them to either receive levothyroxine or placebo to see if by giving them levothyroxine, so they were all TPO antibody positive, they had normal thyroid function, 
but we wanted to see if we gave levothyroxine, whether we could actually improve their pregnancy outcomes. And so this was a negative trial. We found that there was no difference by giving levothyroxine to these TPO antibody positive women uh, compared with placebo and for none of the secondary outcomes. So the first, the primary outcome was live birth at 34 or more weeks. Uh, secondary outcomes, again, uh, there was absolutely no effect here, indicating that yes, TPO antibody positive women are more likely to have a miscarriage and poor pregnancy outcomes, but this cannot be corrected by giving them levothyroxine. And again, this is something that's been incorporated in guidelines. So just to illustrate that uh, from uh, relatively earlier on in my career, I've been involved in guidelines, initially on a working group, uh, but more recently I have led on the NICE guidelines, um, on the Green Top guidelines uh, for thyroid disease in pregnancy, and currently on the uh, guidelines on management of low-risk thyroid cancer. I've also been involved as the lead for management of uh, thyroid dysfunction during COVID-19 with writing European guidance guidelines. So in order to be successful in this, and I think to write good guidelines and to provide good endocrine care, patient involvement and engagement really is crucial. And this is, if you're interested in research, this is absolutely important from the first minute you start conceiving a grant application onwards. Um, I've also worked with a lot of patient rep representatives, patient groups on guideline committees, and that is, again, absolutely vital that we listen to the patient so that what we do, the guidelines we give, are patient-centered, keep the patient at the center of everything we do, and that all the research we do is, again, focused towards improving the lives of patients. I have formed very close working relationship with patient organizations. Um, and I, for example, for the British Thyroid Foundation, I'm a regular advisor on their uh, online forum. Um, I uh, help write patient information leaflets uh, and I give presentations at patient support group meetings. And actually, once this meeting is finished, uh, I'm going straight into a, a focus group for a grant application we're writing. Again, sort of speaking to patients about their experiences and how we can improve our grant. So as I said, this is in order so that we can deliver patient-centered research or patient-centered care. So what are my top tips uh, from a sort of academic endocrinology background. Well, I think both endocrinology and clinical academia are great career choices. So in Birmingham, I also lead the clinical academic training programs for all specialties. Um, and I really think a clinical academic career is extremely rewarding. And endocrinology is one of the specialties where uh, academic research really plays a very important role uh, in careers. I think what I've learned is that it's really important to understand the basis of diseases and certainly in the times that I've taken out of training, I've done, I've looked very much at laboratory uh, and uh, basic science research to understand the basis of disease, but where I have actually been most successful is in the clinical research and in clinical trial research. I think uh, what I've learned is that developing a, mul a multifaceted uh, profile um, is really important if you're interested in guideline setting. Um, I have spent a lot of time setting guidelines and doing evidence review, reviews. I think it's very rewarding, but be aware that this is very time consuming. And if you're going to do research, please make sure that your research questions are clinically relevant. It can be very much be laboratory research, but just make sure that there is a clinical outcome at the end here uh, and I think what I've tried to show is that uh, the basic science research uh, I did very much looked at how can we potentially in the future improve uh, the management of patients with thyroid cancer. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm going to stop there, there now and then I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Bullard. Are you happy to stay with us until um, after the third talk and we'll come on to some questions then. Perfect, I know you, uh, you're shooting over something else afterwards, um, but that, that was wonderful. Thank you, I'm sure we're all very impressed to hear about um, all of this uh, excellent thyroid research you've been involved in over the years. Um, okay, so completing our panel tonight, um, we've got Dr. Jonathan Hazelhurst, um, also representing Birmingham. Um, and Jonathan is a, is a new consultant, which is why it's great to have him on the panel this evening. Um, so he's a consultant in University Hospitals Birmingham, um, and I believe he has an 80%, uh, 20% split between clinical work and research. You'll find that lots of people who are clinically active in endocrinology 
are also um, research focused, but that's not the case for everyone. Um, he's just uh, completed his registrar training in August 2021, so I'm sure he'll have lots of uh, insights into the transition that he's now making. Um, and his particular interest, uh, clinically and academically, is about obesity medicine, um, which you might know is a, a sort of emerging important field in endocrinology. Um, so happy to hear from you tonight, John. Thank you. Thanks very much. I uh, hope you can all hear me and see my slides. Any problems, just jump in and let me know. Um, so yeah, so my, I'm John Hazelhurst and I'm a, a new consultant uh, here in the West Midlands. Um, and I do have a, a small academic footprint as well. Um, obviously, we've just heard from two phenomenally impressive uh, professors. And I'm sure for many of you, that will be hugely inspiring as it is to me. But there will be a few of you who that makes slightly apprehensive and nervous. And, you know, I'm going to make it clear that actually there's something in endocrinology for everybody. And whilst it's a, there's a huge kind of area for capacity to research, um, you know, that's by no means necessary or, or mandatory to pursue your interests. So I'm going to run through a, a few things that, um, you know, why endocrinology? Is it right for me? And the reciprocal question, I suppose, is am I right for it? Um, what, what's the training like? And then what about GIM, which is something I've been asked to talk about, so general internal medicine, which I know is something that it makes um, undifferentiated trainees at times quite apprehensive at going into medical specialties. And I'm going to come on to that. Uh, and like all the other speakers, I'm going to give a few top tips for pursuing uh, endocrinology. Um, I guess a lot of this we've kind of touched upon, haven't we? It's it's phenomenal fun to problem solve. And obviously, um, you know, Stephanie and Christine both made the point that, you know, they, they enjoy this and, and, you know, so do I. There's an enormous amount of complexity, but actually by some, you know, a core knowledge base and some good understanding of actually some basic pathways and the ability to listen to the patient, you can make a real impact to the patient in front of you. And one of the things, the way I look at endocrinology, apart from all of the kind of rare and I guess weird and wonderful type things, we have a lot of common things as well. And, and common things are common. And the way I view common things is this is an opportunity for me, even as a kind of youngish consultant, uh, certainly a new consultant, to provide hopefully excellence in care, which is obviously something I aspire to. So I like to think that if you're in the West Midlands and you see Professor Bola, who's one of my bosses, with thyrotoxicosis, or you see John Hazelhurst with thyrotoxicosis, hopefully you will get a reasonably good deal without too much variation in that interaction. Because I think really common things we should all be delivering to a really good standard. And you know, we've already heard that we all ask each other questions all the time. And you know, Professor Bola, uh, you know, I've basically got Christine on speed dial for my complex kind of thyroid cases. And that's because endocrinologists are very, very friendly people. So the common things are a good opportunity um, to provide really high quality care. Rare things are obviously fascinating. And I think they, they give us a bit of focus. And within our specialty, it's a really wonderful opportunity to actually help our patients. And actually, one of the things that endocrinology offers at times is we can actually cure some endocrine diseases. So we've got a nice mix of managing chronic disease and also potentially uh, kind of curative interventions. Now, one of the things that we think of in endocrinology is we work um, across so many different teams. And I, I counted the number of MDTs I contribute to. Uh, they're not all weekly, obviously there will be time, but I myself contribute to six different MDTs. So that's an enormous breadth, which is wonderful fun, but clearly you do have to work alongside other experts. And over the last week, I just looked at who'd been emailing me and I was thinking about who I work with and I've had emails from surgeons, oncology, hematology, genetics, pharma, you know, which I'm happy to kind of admit to. I do a lot of things alongside pharma because that's where our drugs come from. Um, I've been in contact with the CCG this week. That's going to be a new system soon. GPs and obviously most importantly of all patients. And actually, weirdly, I haven't had many uh, emails interaction with biochemistry this week, who we work with so very closely, of course. Now, I've already made the point that endocrinologists are wonderfully nice people. And I think that's true 99.99% of the time. And I'll come back to that. And I think within our wonderful specialty, there's a real big variety uh, in terms of what you can do. And there's certainly space to pursue your interests, which may be academic, there may be policy, there may be both, or they may be very clinically focused, and that's okay. And we all hopefully spend quite a lot of time trying to develop and improve our services. 
So I guess in the same way that Stephanie did, this is my kind of, uh, I guess this is my week, uh, this is last week. And I want to show you this because actually no two endocrinologists do the same thing. Um, I guess I'm relatively early on, obviously in my career, well, very early on in my consultant career and still very much learning as we all are across life. Um, and this is the kind of makeup of my week. So triaging lots of referrals and kind of clinic admin, I do lots of MDTs. Monday afternoon, I had a joint sax ender, so a new pharmacotherapy for obesity clinic. Um, Tuesday, I do have a small university footprint, and I'm usually at the university on a Tuesday, predominantly writing uh, largely unsuccessful grants and papers and interpreting lots of data. Wednesday last week, I was at an educational meeting all day, which I was speaking at and learning about as well. And at night, I was the general internal medical consultant on call at pretty big hospital in the West Midlands called Heartlands, which is something I really enjoy. Um, and on Thursday, we have our joint um, obesity meeting with the bariatric surgeons, then I have an obesity clinic, then I have a general endocrine clinic. And on Friday morning, depending on which Friday it is, I either do a pituitary clinic or a metabolic bone clinic. Uh, and then I have another MDT, uh, depending on what it is that week. And actually, I also cover our inpatient bed base uh, one week in every four. So I do a fair amount of general medicine, which, you know, I enjoy and I'll come back to. And, you know, really no two endocrinologists do the same thing. Even within my department uh, at Heartlands, which is part of the kind of University Hospitals Birmingham Foundation Trust, there's no two of us which would have the same kind of job plan. Everybody does something different because there is something for everybody. Yes, I'm an academic and this is a fairly academic meeting. We've had two professors speak to us already. Most of my colleagues where I work are not academics and they work full-time uh, NHS. And some of my strongest clinical colleagues are full-time in the NHS. Um, and actually, is it right for me? Well, I think we have a huge scope for all sorts of different types of people. Many of you might have done these kind of personality tests, et cetera, in the past. And there's a huge need across very different areas. And I don't think there is a right answer. So some of my colleagues, for example, work very closely with primary care uh, in kind of community diabetes and policy. Um, and I guess because of the type of center I work in, which is slightly smaller over at Heartlands, you know, many of us will do some diabetes and some endocrinology. And I guess, um, Whereas in some of the larger tertiary centres, you know, it might be a slight split. So if you'd like to do both and do both well, that is possible and that is good fun. You know, some people will be a professor of, you know, whatever it may be, which is fantastic. And one day, maybe I'd like to be a professor of bariatric medicine if I didn't have too lofty ambitions. Um, but there isn't a right answer. You know, there is something across the spectrum of diabetes and endocrinology. No one thing is right and no one thing is wrong and no one thing is worth more than the other. There really is something for absolutely everybody, you know, and it is actually massively fun. Um, hopefully you can see some pictures on the right hand side and you can see there is a kind of steroidogenesis um, uh, kind of diagram, which you may look at and think, goodness me, that's not very much fun. But actually, when you start to kind of routinely care for patients with kind of complex uh, uh, issues with androgens or perhaps it's CAH or whatever it may be, just by some real basic understanding of biochemical pathways, you can really start to help patients in front of you with the symptoms that are for them problematic. Now, there's a question in the chat about money, and I know we're coming to the questions at the end, but actually that doesn't make any sense because in the NHS, uh, all consultants are played for programmed activities, which is a PA, and a standard NHS job is 10 PAs. So depending on what you do, that might be more PAs than that. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm not quite sure where that figure comes from. Perhaps it'll be asked, I don't know. Um, Work-life balance is possible in endocrinology, and we've heard that already. Um, you know, I do lots of kind of different things, but actually I, I work to live. I don't live to work. And I'm not sure that makes me a bad person. I like life and I have a little boy and I have a dog uh, and I have a lovely wife who largely tolerates me and is patient with me. And I have lots of different interests, including running long distances quite slowly um, amongst other things. And I spend lots of time taking pictures, grainy pictures of birds and butterflies. And these are all things that are important to me and they're things that I make time for. Um, endocrinology is quite a supported career. You know, there's lots of hugely nice people, you know, like Christine and Stephanie and other senior endocrinologists that even as a new consultant, you know, I would be asking these kind of people. 
and there's a lot of room to develop self and for others and services. Now, I've been asked to talk about the GIM general medicine balance. Um, and I'll just kind of be brief on this. Lots of you are nervous and apprehensive about general medicine. And that's because, you know, you think it's difficult. And when you're on call, it's busy. Um, disclaimer, when you're a consultant, it's much better. Um, firstly, you do a lot less of it. So you maintain that you enjoy it. And you get to think and problem solve and perhaps do a little bit less doing, uh, dare I say. And remember that you are a junior doctor for a short period of time in the grand scheme of life. And you're a consultant for a very, very long time. But to balance GIM and endocrine training, you do have to be very careful to try and maximize all of your opportunities, um, whether that be in big centers or smaller places. I like to make the point that, you know, study leave, you need to absolutely maximize. But I also make the point that annual leave isn't for working, it's for living your life and how, whatever that might look like. We've got some absolutely fantastic organizations. Here we've got this webinar from Society for Endocrinology and, and YDEF as well. And endocrinologists are nice people. And there's a phenomenal amount of educational material, particularly through the Society for Endocrinology and others. And remember that general medicine isn't scary. It's actually a wonderful opportunity to help people in their time of greatest need. And also I view it as a, an opportunity to raise the profile of endocrinology and to recruit, recruit the next generation hopefully, uh, and not be, to put too many people off into what is an absolutely fascinating uh, specialty. And I guess one of the difficulties sometimes in recruiting to this specialty is as undifferentiated trainees, which many of you will be, you don't always have much exposure to what we would call endocrinology, which mostly happens uh, in outpatients largely. Um, unless you're kind of working in larger surgical centers, you might see patients around the time of their endocrine surgery, for example. But most of your experience of endocrinology and diabetes is obviously management of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis acutely, perhaps diabetic foot emergencies, perhaps a few of the more common endocrine emergencies, perhaps some calcium, sodium, um, kind of Addisonian crisis, etc. cetera. Um, but actually, you don't always get the opportunity to see the wonderful breadth of endocrinology. And I really encourage you, if you're interested, to, to find your local friendly endocrinologist, uh, grab him or her, uh, and you know make a point of kind of trying to somehow fit in, uh, going to a few clinics, and perhaps that includes going to some taster days. I think the taster days, uh, this picture of me and Crystal, who I think is on the call, who uh, is an F2 at a nearby hospital in Birmingham, who'd heard that hopefully I'm a reasonably friendly endocrinologist and I like to talk to people and teach. And she's had a couple of days with me recently, um, exploring her interest in bariatric medicine. And we're now having some kind of conversations around some projects. And I do think getting involved with projects is a really good thing to do to develop your interests, because that gives you an opportunity to hopefully perhaps present a poster or even a talk at one of our wonderful conferences like British Endocrine Society, which provides these hugely generous registration grants for undifferentiated trainees. Um, and there's also lots of other things out there, um, for example, coming along to some of the webinars like this one. And I'd like to make the point that as an undifferentiated uh, trainee, as most people on this call will be, um, the cost of joining the Society for Endocrinology is £10 for the year. So four, four costers, um, a small pizza, or perhaps uh, th three pints of my favourite beer. Um, you know, so actually that's a reasonably achievable amount of money. And actually, if you did join the Society for Endocrinology, and I'm not, I'm not getting any funds from them, I just think it's a wonderful organization. It gives you the opportunity um, to come to some of the clinical webinars and learn a little bit a bit more endocrinology. And all of that content is recorded so you can do it in your own time. So find your endocrinologist, uh, grab him or her, get some opportunities, and maximize them as best as they can. And don't be afraid of general medicine because it's great fun. And welcome to endocrinology. I think that completes my talk. Brilliant, thank you, John. That was a really practical talk full of, uh, full of tips for everybody watching. Um, so I'll just invite your other speakers to come back and unmute themselves. Um, I'll just give you the sad news, John, though, that beer is going up 40 p a pint, according to the news today. So. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we'll uh, try and work our way through uh, some of the questions. Um, uh, if anybody's got any more, 
feel free to keep sending them in. Um, we might just try and tie up this uh, doctor's salary one, first of all, since you've already raised it. Um, my instinct is that this might be an American um, statistic and not anything to do with the UK. But obviously, I'm not, I'm not a, a consultant. I'm not an expert in your salaries, but I don't think that rings true for me either. Well, we don't starve. Um, you know, I think I think we do OK. And we're paid the same on the same basis as every other specialty. So there isn't really a basis for this question because every NHS consultant is, is paid in PAs, which is a unit of time. Um, so actually, there isn't really a kind of meaningful basis to that question to provide any different answer. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so someone's asked, um, if you're a student, you're still in medical school, um, or if you're uh, very early in your training as a foundation doctor, what would be the things that, that you could do um, to, uh, to find out more about endocrinology or um, improve your portfolio if, if you think about planning the future? I know you've covered some things, um, John, but maybe our other panelists might have some ideas as well. Uh, sorry, Christine, go. Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm sure we are saying exactly the same. We probably could speak. Uh in chorus. So, so when people come for the interviews, I think there's a lot of anxiety because if you do IMT or have done CMT, uh, so core medical training, you might not have a, a, a placement in diabetes and endocrinology that may be out of your control. And we, we realize that. So you, you may end up doing hematology and geriatrics and psychiatry and something else. And so we know this. So this won't disadvantage you in comparison to somebody who has done endocrinology <laughs> in their training. Uh, but you will need to show that you have uh, an interest in a specialty, a commitment to the specialty. Uh, so you need to sort of make up for the fact that you haven't been in, you are not in that post. Uh, so the easiest is to, I think, even this taster day would demonstrate you have interest. Going to clinics, as John has said, uh, doing audits, small projects. So if you are in geriatrics, you could look at osteoporosis in your patients. You could look at diabetes, at thyroid disease. Uh, and you could do this with your own consultants and the local endocrinologist. So you would say, I'm looking for a project, I'm interested, everybody will support you. You could then, that would give you the chance to get experience, but to do a poster, uh, to apply, for example, to the Society for Endocrinology Conferences, you get a free student grant, you could apply to attend a conference uh, fully supported, uh, and you could do so you could quality improvement projects, audit, uh, or anything else. So I think anything you do is, is, is you need to just remember yes, that you want to demonstrate an interest or a commitment to the specialty, but you will not be penalized for not having done a job in that field. And your local endocrinologist is probably the easiest person to speak to and then to help you to work out what to do. And then often it's easiest to go back to sort of leaves them to do something which you, you have an interest in to so try to combine those two things. Okay. Thank you. Christine, did you have something else to add? Yeah, and, and fully endorse that. I think there's always audit, audits going for medical students, junior trainees. Society for Endocrinology have amazing ventures, uh, uh, with, uh, with summer studentships. Um, so my son is a medical student. He got a summer studentship from the Society for Endocrinology, had a great time, got two papers out of that, uh, then made some links to, this, to do some audits uh, with other people. Uh, as Jonathan has said, we're friendly people. We always have a lot of things that we, you know, we like things regulated. So we like to audit things and make sure that everything is done. We like, I like guidelines. We like to make sure they're followed. Uh, so there's always ways of assessing it. Um, and, you know, there are so many different ways that you can spice your CV and the Society for Endocrinology have huge opportunities. So go on their website uh, and you will see the various opportunities financially and otherwise that are available to you. Um, and I'll also add that they, they've been doing a thing recently with a video prize um, for students rather than the old fashioned essay prize. Um, other panelists might have been involved in this. I've been involved in the marking of that, uh, which was really brilliant. And you'll be able to see some examples of videos that students have, have made online. So I would encourage you to, to have a look into that as well. Um, I think we'll move on to the next question. Uh, maybe this is, is one for, for John and I to tackle, particularly because they're asking about being an endocrine trainee and, um, and what the hours are like as an endocrine trainee. Um, and maybe that's a bit in comparison um, to other other specialties um, in medicine. 
Do you want me to do you want to start that question, Kerry, or do you want me to go? Um, perhaps you start because I'm yeah. actually out of program and have been for ages. So, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, you're yeah, closer to that than me, to be honest. Yeah, no problem. So look, you know, all medical specialties, you, you know, will you will have a general medical component to that, which will have an on-call rotor, which you know will vary slightly from region to region and different training programs, which are regionally managed. Um, it is manageable. I don't think there is a specialty that I see where you wouldn't have an out of hours and antisocial hours commitment. So I don't think endocrinology is any worse than any other medical specialty or indeed any surgical specialty or indeed actually any specialty. I mean, yes, perhaps if you were a GP, you wouldn't be the medical registrar at night, but I think you know the GPs have got their own challenges um, which are significant and are demanding. So, you know, I don't see our training in endocrinology and general medicine as being either an easy option or indeed a disproportionately difficult option. You know, there will always be trainees that have got, you know, unique personal circumstances, which can usually be factored into rotors and rotor design, whether that be less than full time, which is obviously extremely common. Perhaps people have got caring responsibilities, you know, whatever it may be. Perhaps they've got health problems. You know, certainly some of my colleagues on health grounds, you know, haven't worked the same kind of nights intensity rotors as I have in the past, which has been fine um so you know there are ways and means to support everybody with an interest in pursuing our specialty and uh, people shouldn't be deterred and it's no, no harder and no easier if you like um i've had a look at the list of medical specialties that don't involve um gim um and it's uh it's not it's not long and it's it's quite unusual <laughs> so things like um allergy medicine and um sort of audio vestibular medicine uh, maybe some of the sports medicine that sort of thing so there is there is a list from drc PT and, our, and, our, invested, and but... our immunologists were wonderful on our emergency covid rotor working side by side with us in a and e and we're hugely valued members of the team so you know whatever it says on a list historically it's always subject to change when needs arise isn't it there, there is another point is that the, the curriculum is coming out again for diabetes and endocrinology next year. So this is the, what should be in a training. Uh, and it looks like there's going to be an agreement that a year of the training will be without general medicine. So a year of training will be pure diabetes and endocrinology. So I think people are aware of the challenge and try to make it uh, fair, really. And I think with the new changes, with exactly as John is saying and, and Carrie Z, the balance, more general, more medical specialties are involved in the general on medical on call, and that should probably take make the load a bit lighter as well. Yes, it depends a little bit on what kind of centre you're in. For example, if you're in a, a tertiary centre where um, perhaps they do transplant medicine, um, you know the respiratory team end up having a special transplant rotor, or the liver team have a transplant rotor. You know, so sometimes there are very specific situations that take other specialties off the GIM rota, um, but that's that's quite particular. Most of you know, if you're in a DGH or you know a, a big general hospital, then you know. Every, everybody is, is contributing for medicine um, and, and evenly. Um, and there's always lots of work and feedback going into that. So um, it's, it's not a, a particular thing that's related to diabetes and endocrinology. Lots of consultants, I think, do quite a lot of general medicine in, in diabetes and endocrinology in TGH. So that might perhaps be where, um, where you get this feeling that, there, that there's lots of us in, in general medicine, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't need to be the case, certainly as a trainee. Um, somebody thought that their consultant had managed to qualify without doing any night shifts. Um, but I think if you were training in diabetes and endocrinology in the UK now, um, unless you had a very particular personal circumstance that was related to not being able to, to do shift work, um, then I, I, I don't understand quite how that came about. So uh, I'm not aware that that's, uh, that's an option for, for any of us. Um, someone's asked about um, endocrinologists working in the community. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we think about endocrinologists as being in the hospital, sometimes as being, you know, tertiary as well as secondary. So what do you think about endocrinologists in the, in the, in the community? Is that happening now? Is that going to happen in the future? Christine? I can't see it happen imminently. So there are certainly, if you do diabetes, there are community diabetes uh, consultants. Um, and um, obviously, if you want to do private practice, you can go do that anywhere. Um, but, um, you know, I think by and large, 
many endocrinologists do a combination of diabetes and endocrinology. Uh, there are some large tertiary centers, such as, you know, one where I work, uh, where things are highly super specialized, but that is, I think, an exception rather than a rule, um, you know, because that comes back to a further question that's in the, in the chat that there are certain centers where there's highly super specialization and like, you know, where I work, essentially every endocrinologist has one organ. So I do, I do only thyroid disease and then I do general endocrine on call, but there are not very many like me in the UK. And I like that uh, and it fits, it fits with what I've done, but it actually doesn't make me very employable everywhere else because, you know, it, it, is, it is highly super specialized. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, many endocrinologists keep it broad, but having pure community endocrinologists, I cannot see that happen anytime really soon. I don't know where the other panel members have other views on that. I, I don't, I would absolutely agree with you. I think the only thing to say is things are changing a lot in the, in the medical landscape. So we don't know what might happen. The other thing is over our career, things are changing. So what we have started, I'm sure Christine is the same, what we have started as jobs and what Jonathan's job plan is now in 10 years time will be quite different because there will be other opportunities. You will have other interests. People, the hospitals will have other needs. Uh, so you, your, your life changes and that's really nice. So it's a very portfolio able uh, career and often people do general medicine at the start of their career and then later on they might change and do more teaching or more management and something else. So I think it's great because you can sort of really find what you like uh, so you don't do the same thing for all your life. I would say it's important to um, to speak with your with your local team because quite often the people who um who, who come to these events like all of us here people who are involved in the society are perhaps a bit more likely to be sort of academically active and and maybe have more of a subspecialty interest um whereas you know in, in your local hospital um this the sort of di diabetes and endocrinology clinicians that you meet are maybe more likely to be more generalist seeing a broader range of patients doing both diabetes and endocrinology etc so it's important to to get a flavor for the type of work that everybody in the specialty is is doing because you know the, there are lots of different paths and different options um, for you as a clinician and um, i'm wondering if, if john's got any thoughts about uh, obesity management going forward that that might be an area that i could see going more into community yeah, because there's a huge need actually, um, and there's big gaps in kind of the medical curriculum and uh, clinicians' kind of expertise, um, and also there's a huge amount of pharmacotherapy that is going to become available within the next five years. And obviously, we already have uh, a limited portfolio of medications. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a huge growth area. Um, it is an area that can be delivered within kind of community hubs, you know, very very well indeed, and lots of medical weight management services, you know, operate within the community. And there are clinicians that, you know, that's what they do, you know, kind of full, full time. Um, so that's that's the kind of area where, you know, you could be predominantly community based. Um, and, you know, I'd like to make the point about kind of expertise and, you know, Christine's kind of making the point about kind of single organ expertise. Um, people like me who are at the stage of my career where I do do a bit of this and a bit of that and enjoy a bit of this and a bit of that you know people like me really need people like Christine and Stephanie and their expertise um, because actually you know when we're stuck and we're out of our depth um, you know this is when you know we turn to our friendly senior you know academic expert you know and ask the question and I think you know whether you are you want to kind of do a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of diabetes and endocrinology and medicine or maybe you do want to be a professor of you know whatever it may be you know, this is a specialty with something for everybody. I think that touches a bit on something that um, Professor Balderweg was talking about earlier about uh, communication within the specialty, you know, on Twitter and, and in real life. Um, for me, I think it's a specialty where we do talk a lot about um, conditions we have. Um, it, you know, in Newcastle, we have, you know, the sort of grand round idea of presenting cases. I'm sure you'll have that in Birmingham and in London as well it's it's a great specialty for for discussing the intricacies going through the the pathway going you know going through uh, the biochemistry and the dynamic testing and seeing how things evolve with the patient's um, history and examinations and investigations it's, it's a great specialty for for discussion I think that's one of the things I really like about it um, 
so I think staying on the theme really of, of kind of, of subspecialty, someone's asked what, what the subspecialties within endocrinology actually are, and maybe we can also highlight some of the more sort of up and coming ones as well. Who would like to, who would like to take that? So, I mean, there are the classic, so here uh, in Birmingham, we have a uh, thyroid clinic, we have pituitary clinic, we have reproductive clinic, we have late effects clinic, we have survival of childhood cancer clinic, we have growth hormone clinic, we have um, obesity clinic, Jonathan, help me out, am I forgetting any here? Um, well, well, clinic, well, 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 I... I controversially believe that the pancreas, from our perspective, is predominantly an endocrine organ. Um, but that puts me in a minority of one, usually. Um, and obviously, within diabetes, we have a huge range, but that was covered yesterday. Metabolic bone, I don't think you mentioned. Um, genetic bone, I think you mentioned young adults, Turner specific clinics as well. Um, neuroendocrine? Neuroendocrine, yeah, net, net clinics, net MDT clinics. Yeah, there's a, yeah, you, you name it. Yeah. One thing we have in endocrine clinics, there are also, you know, there is also, we also still do general endocrinology. Yeah. Uh, you'll yeah. Be yeah. To I think there's actually very little official sub subspecialty at the moment. There's some discussion about obesity and about fertility, but it's not really. Uh, it's not offered so people sort of find their own again, like you might find your own mentors to get you started in endocrinology people find their own path of becoming uh like uh, christine had said becoming a thyroid specialist so in a way so there isn't there isn't a certification to make anyone a pituitary or thyroid specialist uh, i think there's discussion about obesity and there's discussion about uh, fertility at the moment but it's not it's not a real uh so, so it's not you're not accredited so your experience and your interest will make you uh, the expert there it can be a bit like uh, in a GP surgery, you know, there would be one GP who deals more with children, one who deals more with women's health, one who deals with mental health. You know, it's, un it's unofficial, but it's recognised within your group and people sort of send you in that direction because they know that's what you're interested in. Um, one thing we didn't mention as a subspecialty that's in the questions here is about transgender medicine. And I think that's, um, that's one of the areas that's probably hopefully going to be an up and coming um, subspecialty uh, area within endocrinology. Um, and Leighton Seal would be um, is the I, I think the, the sort of core endocrinologist in the UK who's a, who's a transgender medicine endocrinologist who would be the person to, probably to, to contact if you were interested in finding out more about uh, about transgender medicine. I know a lot of that is delivered by psychiatry um, at the moment through the transgender service, but um, uh, certainly where, where I am in the northeast, it's a service that they're hoping to build on from from the endocrine perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know about elsewhere, but that's something that's a bit more, um, you know, up and coming in, in the future. I think one thing to add to this, which we haven't touched upon and actually did, possibly didn't touch upon enough in our talks is that a lot of our clinics are multidisciplinary. So we have lots of multidisciplinary meetings, but also I don't think I do a single clinic that's not multidisciplinary. So I do a pregnancy clinic with the obstetricians, I do a thyroid clinic with the surgeons, I do a thyroid oncology clinic with surgeons and oncologists. Uh, I do a radio iodine clinic with the nuclear physicists. Uh, I do a genetic oncology clinic with geneticists. And um, it actually makes, makes for very interesting medicine that you do. And also, you know, it's nice. You know, it's very collaborative. It's 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 very multidisciplinary, and I think transgender medicine is is one of those uh, examples where where you need all those inputs from the various specialties. But I think that makes it the beauty of our specialty. Thank you. Um, maybe just one last quick question, then I think to to finish us off. Um, so the last question we've had is, uh, I suppose, a bit of a diabetes versus endocrine question. Um, and uh, if you if you're wanting to sort of carve a path for yourself that's down uh, down the one route uh, and down this route, really, in endocrinology, um, should you take a more academic pathway? Can you be a, a generalist that is an endocrinologist? So, so Jonathan has already put a nice answer there, no. um, which I think is true. So. When I started in research, it was actually, it was a negative choice. It was at a time that in order to get a national training number, you needed to do something different on your CV. So I entered research 
a bit like, well, okay, I'll do some research then because it's going to get me on the ladder. And it's, you know, it's not that I said, oh, I'm so academic. This is what I want to do. It then, you know, really caught my enthusiasm and my passion. Um, equally, you know, that, you know, and all, quite a few diabetologists uh, where that is the case. But uh, like Jonathan says, you know, you don't, I think, first of all, you don't know whether you're academic until you've tried it. Um, and I think, secondly, no, it's not just for uh, academics. And uh, a lot of the really, really good endocrinologists I know are really not very academic. Um, but they are very good doctors. I think there's a big, I, a big caution as well to uh, to specialize too early. Yeah. So 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 a it will make you much less employable. So if you all you've ever done is, I mean, you won't get through a training program only seeing bone disease, for example. Mm -hmm. But if that's your all interest in every poster you do is about bone disease, you may either get this amazing niche job. But if this job doesn't exist for five years because someone else has just got it, you will be not really very employable. So if you have to earn a living, which most of us do, you will have to, you, you're better off having a broad sort of training and experience with some specialty in it, which you like. And then as you, as you go on in your career, either as a trainee or as a consultant in the later years, you can sort of find find more of what you would like to do. So I would really caution, I think also for your own, it's a bit like doing just French, German, and maybe, I don't know, Spanish for your A-levels. That would really mean you're missing out on a lot of other, other great education. So I would think broadly uh, for quite a while. Yeah, employability is a big thing, isn't it? So research is one way to make yourself more employable, but there's others, there's endocrinologists who are interested in safety, in management, um, in teaching, you know, other areas that are not really anything to do with research, um, but are, uh, you know, something extra that you can provide. So there's definitely room for that too. Um, I'm aware we've, we've ran over time with our discussion this evening. So um, I think we will draw the webinar to a close. Um, but I'd just like to thank all of our panelists tonight for, um, for all of their excellent um, uh, presentations and, and also the, the discussion that we've had. Um, and thank everybody who's joined us tonight um, for, for your questions. And I hope that this has been uh, useful and has maybe helped sway you um, in, in, a, in a certain direction for, for your future. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for the society for, for organizing. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.